So one year and one month since the government published this document, the benefits of Brexit. <laughs> How the UK is taking advantage of leaving the European Union. In the foreword to that document, the then Prime Minister said, and I'm going to quote him at length from this, every word a jewel. <laughs> we got Brexit done to take back control, to make our own laws, to manage our own economy, money. The act of Brexit was not an end in itself, but a means by which our country will achieve great things. I'm adding in the Churchillian <laughs> tone in order to evoke the full impact of this wonderful rhetoric. And so that historic night two years ago marked not the final page of the story, but the start of a whole new chapter for our country, our economy, and our people. A future in which we seize the incredible opportunities that our freedom presents, making our businesses more competitive and our people more prosperous. This is 13 months ago. This paper sets out how we'll go about it, untangling ourselves from 40 years of EU membership. That's enumerated. We've actually been a member for 47 years. But what's the percentage between friends? Firmly planting the British flag on the world stage once again. This isn't piloty. This is what the guy wrote. <laughs> this is a hugely exciting time for our country, one filled with potential an opportunity. The bolder we are, the greater the gains will be for us all. And as this document demonstrates, this is a government that possesses the ambition and determination the UK needs now to succeed for many years to come. Boris Johnson. We get to stuff. Well, his uh, potential and opportunity didn't last full course, but that is another story. And I use these figures for several reasons. Amongst them, it's an antidote to the gaseous boosterism that's now become the conservative stock in trade. And the gas in question is methane. Obviously, post-COVID and pumped up by energy costs in the wake of Putin's current war on Ukraine, inflation has infected every economy in the world. But we've got the added burden of Brexit. And that certainly inhibits the ability of the United Kingdom to achieve inflation rates that are lower than comparable countries. Like other analysts, the Institute for International Economics says Brexit is the primary driver of the inflation differential. And Sussex University Centre for Trade Policy says Brexit is the most plausible reason why Britain is doing comparably worse than comparable countries. In short, while Brexit is obviously not the sole or single cause of the cost of living crisis, it's made the price and supply problems much more difficult to absorb and to solve. Of that 52% weren't stupid, they weren't racist, they were just hopeful. Those falsehoods were forceful. They were potent. You will remember some of the most telling. Brexit might cause some disruption, but no, no economic disadvantage. The UK is poorer than it would have been in measurable terms of growth, investment, productivity, opportunity, public services, 
and physical well-being. Brexit would radically reduce immigration. A ban on immigration from the EU would generate jobs and improve wages. Inward migration has actually risen very substantially. But we now have very serious sectoral labour shortages. Wages, you will have noticed, have stagnated. The Irish border, we were told, the Irish border with the EU would bring no problems. The UK and the EU are still groping for solutions and there's been no devolved government in Northern Ireland for 51 weeks. Brexit would facilitate a US trade deal for Manson. That was guaranteed. There's been no such trade deal. And the stasis over Northern Ireland means that it's unlikely to be one in the foreseeable future. Brexit would mean 350 million pounds extra a week for the National Health Service. But lower growth means lower revenues available for spending. Any surge in health funding since 2020 has come because of the COVID emergency, not because of any figmentary EU savings. Meanwhile, the post-Brexit loss of qualified health and social care staff has added pressures to those services. And we still have 2.5 beds per 100,000 people in Britain compared to a European average of 5.9 beds per 1,000 people. The promises of unready exit, of holding all the cards, of striking the easiest deals in history were rolled out like fudge in a sweet factory. And the greatest most magnetic undertaking was that the UK would take back control. We would regain and reassert our sovereignty. Now sovereignty is a fine word invoking feelings of independence, self-determination, self-reliance. But for countries, especially democracies, Standalone sovereignty hasn't been a reality for a very long time. In the world now, and for many decades past, the reality has not been splendid sovereignty in its pomp and circumstance. It's been interdependence, alliance, cooperation, accord, mutuality. That's been the means by which the human race has survived. And for a medium-sized trading country in Northern Europe, the best means of enjoying the power and influence to advance and protect national interests, meaningful sovereignty, is to mutually share parts of it with other democracies in a community of jointly determined law. That too is the reality. Withdrawal doesn't bring autonomy. It brings insecurity. It brings dependency on the convenience of others and on the ebb and flow of economic and political convenience. What Mark Carney called the kindness of strangers. Or on the other side of the coin, their lack of trust and generosity. Brexit, we were told, would bring back control of money, borders, and laws. The currency has been substantially devalued, and the global recoil from 49 days of trustonomics showed that finance cannot be controlled like some kind of monetary house pet. The migration figures, the small boat tragedy, and the chaos in the Home Office 
show that the bodies are not managed, let alone controlled. Yes, that's right. Yes. I, I've never really done anything physically in my life, so I, um, I wouldn't know how to help the schools. I'd like to know where I should go from here. Question <laughs> of leadership. That's a difficulty always for the European Union. But because of its formation and the relative size of countries and economies and the assertiveness of various leaderships, it's clear that much of the time the development, the velocity, the strength and breadth of the European Union depends upon the quality of leadership.